good morning and welcome back to another video so I'm just outside Pops's house and um, picking Pops up this morning and Pops and me are off up into the Lake District to the Cumbria Wildlife Hide um, it's a hide I've heard about for quite some time now I follow a few people on Instagram that have been to uh, Cumbria Wildlife Hide and they've got some fantastic photographs woodland birds and in particular sparrowhawks now I know I've photographed sparrowhawks before for the channel um, I photographed them at Alan McFadden's hide and I photographed them at um, Yorkshire Wildlife Hides um, so two places that I photographed sparrowhawks but for me I, I can't get enough of them they're an absolutely fantastic bird um, beautiful beautiful eyes stunning coloration particularly on the male um, so for, for me it, it's definitely worth the trip and more importantly it's important that I get out with Pops and we spend a day photographing together so come along for the journey and see what I see morning son morning Pops you okay I'm fine are you yeah I'm, thank you good drove up it's taken about two and a half hours and we're in the location now where we are waiting upon either Stephen or Linda who's going to meet us um, we're just at a rugby club gates so we're going to meet them at the rugby club gates and they'll take us on to the hide that's quite common practice when you go to hides it's it's very rare that you drive straight up to a hide in most instances they give you a location to meet and then they drive you onto the hide now it might be that we have to keep the hide location um, under wraps and if that's the case the next time I probably speak to camera it will be when we're in the hide if not I'll get some footage um, on the way to the hide and you can join us for the journey say hello pops seeing as you're here good morning folks hope you're all well so pops is with us and he's brought me some uh, camera equipment to try out today which is fantastic <laughs> tell the good people what you've brought with us because you've been spending money again haven't you pops just a little bit yeah no, um, I've brought uh, my new 400mm um, Z lens, um, prime lens, and my 100 to 400. So I think you're going to be borrowing my 100 to 400. Or the 400 prime, you never know. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder why you invited me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be a reason, hasn't there? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so Pops has bought the new five hundred. No, sorry, 400. the new four hundred um, prime. The f four point five. F four point five. Okay, so uh, this is its first venture out. So he's going to be using it for the first time. Um, quite a few people have already got this lens and are raving about it, particularly its mm. sharpness. Um, so that's something that we'll have a look at and we'll feed back to you on. And um, seeing as my dad had already bought the 100 to 400, instead of me, you know, struggling between the 70 to 200 or my 500 mil, I thought I'd borrow it and have a little go, a little play with that. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a review of the 100 to 400, and then perhaps uh, throughout the day and, and uh, by the end of the day, we'll do a comparison because Pops has already used the 100 to 400 many, many times before, and he'll be able to give you that comparison uh, to the 400. So we'll be able to give you that as well. So stay with us, stay tuned, stay tuned right away to the end of the video um, where we'll talk about the differences between the two lenses and what's good and what's bad about it. And fingers crossed we've got some photographs of a few birds, maybe a sparrowhawk or two along the way. So we're in the hide. Um, as I explained before, um, as is quite often the case in hides like this, they want us to keep the location um, off grid so that other people don't come and tamper with it and I completely understand that I think that's the right thing for anybody to do um, the hide is is a really really fantastic little hide um, it's been covered in astroturf uh, to blend in which looks fantastic yeah the birds are coming in already um, and what you've got is you've got a log pile in front I'll, I'll show you that on the video and um, we've got a log pile in front and there's some piping in the log pipe in, in the log pile that is ceramic piping and um, what Stephen has just explained to me is that they get um, bank voles and so the voles come in um, so it, he's put the pipe in there so that the voles can come in so you can hopefully get some nice shots with it we've got a post to the side with a false tap on it and the tap's got some suet in it so that the, the woodpecker sits just below it and looks like it's taking a drink from the tap that's fantastic 
and then you've got some posts to the back of the setup and and that will hopefully um, bring bring the birds in but there's also lots of seed and peanuts and suet that's been put out to bring in the songbirds and there's a whole manner of songbirds that are coming to the posts already well looks good doesn't it pops it certainly does yeah yeah it's a nice location this nice setup yeah, very impressed I'm such a creature of habit. I lasted about 10 minutes with the 100 to 400 lens. Not because there was anything wrong with it, because there wasn't at all. I was just yearning for my 500. <laughs> um, I love this lens. I know it's a battle axe. I know it's an old lens. It weighs a ton. But at 500 mil with an F4 aperture, it obliterates the backgrounds. And the far perches when I were looking through the 100 to 400 at its, at its furthest focal length at 400 um, its narrowest aperture is, is it 5.6 or 5.6 5.6 mm. immediately behind the, the far perches you've got um, some pink and green flowers which will make a lovely background it just wasn't that smooth um, at, at, at f5.6 the only sacrifice I've had to make by moving to the 500 is the nearest post, which has got the tap on it. I'm not going to get a woodpecker drinking out of that, so we're going to rely on pops to get that image. Um, he's on the 400 mil prime. So between the two of us, we should be able to achieve that. So I've just been out now, upset everything, everything's gone quiet again. So we'll have to wait a little bit of time for everything to settle and come back in. And then hopefully we'll start to get the shots. But already we've had a, a bullfinch which is a, a bird I'm desperate to get a photograph unfortunately it was masked by some foliage we've had countless of the great tits blue tits uh, cold tits we've had nuthatch chaffinches uh, blackbirds um, so yeah it's Wood, woodpeckers. woodpecker yeah the great spotted woodpecker has been in I've got a little bit of video which I'll pop up on the screen now for you um, so it, it, it's definitely a productive hide so it's just a case now sitting back keeping nice and quiet I'm waiting for them to come in. So me and Pops have just had a really good debate about IDing great spotted woodpecker. So I'm going to put two, maybe three photographs on the, on the screen now. And the first photograph that I'm going to put up is of a male great spotted woodpecker. So you'll notice that it has a small little bit of red at the back of the head and that shows that it's a male. The next photograph I'm going to pop up is a female great spotted woodpecker this one doesn't have red on its head at all and then the final one I'm going to put up which was the one that was causing us a little bit of uh, discussion is a juvenile and the juvenile looks like it's got it's dyed all its hair red so it's got a full red head it's like a punk rocker yeah it does look like a punk rocker so the juvenile's on the post at the minute yeah <laughs> So that was really, really interesting, weren't it, Pops? We're yeah. photographing the woodpeckers on the post. Um, and then a flash came in, huge amount of commotion, and the sparrow hawks just nailed a chaffinch onto the ground and then flown off with it. Now, there are people out there that, that will um, condemn 
baiting methods, um, particularly of, of, of raptors. Um, and there are two posts with chicks attached to them, dead chicks attached to them. And it just goes to show that despite the bait that's out, the sparrow hawk will always favour um, a live prey. Um, so it's just took the chaffinch as opposed to the two easy meals that are on offer for it. Um, not a chance in hell of getting a photograph. I didn't even know what had happened. I thought a cat or something had got the bird. <laughs> it happened so fast. Um, but the interesting thing is the um, woodpecker on the, on the branch down there is, is actually frozen and it still hasn't moved. <laughs> I think it's the juvenile. Yeah, yeah, I'm, it's a juvenile. It is, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually filming it at the moment, so I'll yeah. put that up on screen while yeah. we're talking. <laughs> That's amazing. It's not moved at all. No, it hasn't, has it? It's stayed no. in the same position. It's not yeah. feeding. Ah, it's moving now. It's just coming round. Yeah. But it's not feeding. No, no, it's. Uh, it's not feeding. It's just. Like as if it's glued to that post. No sooner had we turned the camera off just then, when the female sparrow hawk came in and landed on the post. I'd say we've probably just had the best part of 20 minutes. Easily, easily, yeah. Um, I thought she, she flew off at one point and then came back again to finish, so yeah. something spooked her. Yeah, but what's interesting um, and I probably caught it on the GoPro, possibly on the audio on the GoPro, is that you could hear um, her calling as she was circling above us. And then I've just kind of peered out through the hide and there was two, two sparrow hawks up in the sky just above us. So male and a female or maybe female with juvenile, not quite sure. Um, fantastic to see though. What an awesome raptor it really is. It does make me think that that one that came in and took the chaffinch off the off the ground was the male or, yeah. or a juvenile. Yeah, yeah. It was a different bird than uh, it the was, one that wasn't it? In. Definitely. Yeah, it was a more more um, chestnut colour. Yeah, mm, ch chestnut colour's female though. Not the, on its breast. Right on it. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the breast. That's that's the male. Either way, the Cumbria Wildlife Hide is certainly living up to the expectations um, fantastic experience so far and we've only been in just an hour and 25 minutes <laughs> so we've a long day ahead of us yet um, but I think following that sparrow walk it's definitely time for a celebratory cup of coffee ah, I think so yeah, yeah. Cheers. Cheers. To the sparrow walk. Was you videoing? Oh, he's back, he's back. <coughs> Bastard. <laughs> he just chucked his sandwich in his cup of coffee. <laughs> I friggin' hate you at times. One of the things that I do with the um, the camera when we're in a hide 
is because the Z9 doesn't suffer with any lag whatsoever when you turn it on to being ready to fire it's instant um, whenever you get quiet period I switch it off it just saves that battery I mean the battery in the Z9 is fantastic it lasts for ages and ages it's very rare that I have to change a battery during a, um, you know a, a photography sitting in a hide um, but I think it's things like that that kind of you know good habit good habit forming that stop that from happening the other thing that I do and I do it as a um, as a habit really is that's just before I'm going to turn the camera off I check my settings now the reason for that is if a sparrow was to land on that post now I want the camera on and I want to start photographing straight away what I don't want to be doing is turning the camera on checking the settings because by the time I've done all of those things although they only take seconds I may have missed it missed the opportunity so before I turn it off, I set it to my base settings. Now I've spoken about my kind of base settings, my foundation settings before. And that is that I will always have it at a thousand, ice, a thousand shutter speed. So one thousandth of a second shutter speed. I'll have the aperture set at 5.6 and the ISO is at auto. That is my foundation. That is my baseline. And so that when I turn the camera on and start pressing that the, the, the trigger button, I'm getting shot straight away. And there's a very good chance with that generic setting that I'm going to capture the shot that I want. As soon as I've kind of settled into it, that's when I start adjusting. So I might slow my shutter speed down. If the bird's static, I might increase the shutter speed if the bird's active. I might change the aperture to give me more depth of field if I need it. Or actually, if it's parallel to the camera, um, I might shallow up the depth of field to ensure that I've got that really diffused background. Um, if the bird's white, I might use the exposure compensation and bring the uh, exposure compensation down. If the bird's dark and it's a bright background, I'll increase the exposure compensation. But all of those things are done after that initial foundation setting, which guarantees that I'm going to get something for, for, my, for my troubles. So just a little tip that might be worthwhile for all those people who do go and sit in, in hides. <coughs> for those of you that have been following the channel for a while, you will know that one of the birds that me and Pops love to photograph are jays. Mm. And so we were really excited when we could hear a jay in the canopy. And then we saw it flutter up into the tree. So my dad's giggling because he knows what's coming. And then this <laughs> scruffy, <laughs> and I mean scruffy, jay landed on the post <laughs> at the back. <laughs> like he'd been out on the sauce all night. <laughs> Yeah, definitely got the flavour. <laughs> so anyway, I took one photograph and stopped bothering. <laughs> that one certainly wasn't a stunning example of what a jay can look like. I'll pop up a pic. <laughs> I will pop up a picture on the screen now. That's easy for you to say, <laughs> <laughs> so you can see it for yourself. What I will say is, um, 
Stephen and Linda, who are, who run this hide, own this hide, they can't do enough for you. Um, they've been messaging all day, seeing if we've if we've had any visits from the sparrowhawk. They've been overjoyed when we have had the, sp the visit from the sparrowhawk, and then they've even been back. Stephen's been back to provide us with anything extra that we needed, any any further bait that we needed, and um, just a bit of a advice really with some of the the perches and talking us through the the different things that we can expect to see and where they might come from and and. It, they just have been absolutely fantastic, haven't they, Pops? Absolutely. You, you couldn't ask for better people to look after you. Terrific. Yeah, so I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend this hide. It's been yeah. a fan fantastic experience, and we're only really kind of halfway through, so, mm. yeah, thumbs up. Brilliant. But we've just been discussing that we're definitely going to come back in the winter months. Yeah. Uh, because this canopy over here will it'll have dropped all the leaves. We can get better light than this, and it'll be a different experience. Yeah, you'll need your uh, winter woolies on though, because <laughs> it'll be certainly cold. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely a worth trip back um, in the winter months for a different experience. So I'm just going to um, show you around the hide and the setup a little bit so you can uh, have an idea if you choose to come here what you can expect. So we've got the hide here. Um, I love this hide. It's a fantastic little hide. They've covered the outside with uh, AstroTurf and I just think in terms of a hide and looking inconspicuous and blending in with the environment, that looks fantastic. Um, <clears throat> every hide <coughs> woodland hide should have with it a log pile and we can see we've got the log pile there okay log piles are absolutely essential they, they bring with it a whole element of uh, an ecosystem there so they're definitely worthwhile um then we've got the perches now there are loads of perches in fact i'll just take you to that first at the back here we've got loads of perches that have been set up so these have all been set up and they've all got spikes on the bottom and it is just a case of selecting your perch and they're not precious at all about you you're changing things around so you can select a perch stab it in the ground and away you go and there's a whole myriad of various different perches there for you to choose from uh, for you to use for, for for your setup and then there are loads of things that they've already got set up for you um we've got here a tap so it's not connected to water or anything but what they've done with this tap is they've put some suet in the end there and the birds kind of land on the on the perch here and then hover up to try and get the suet out of it that that would produce some fantastic shots then <clears throat> throughout the log pile what you'll see uh, and i'll show you now uh, throughout the log pile there are loads of different points where they put suet in and then there are the little pots behind with various different feed and the suets and the idea is that obviously once you've got all your feed out on there your birds are coming in and they're landing on it uh, there's a huge tree next to the hide that's got drill holes in it with suet packed into it um, there is a, a tree over to the side here there's a big post here this was the woodpecker's favorite they've spent all day on this in fact i think we've had a juvenile woodpecker here for most of the day and then you've got some um, big perches to the back. And again, you can chop and change these as much as you want. Um, we've got a tree there. You obviously can't change that. Um, but that's one of the posts that they put the, the bait out for the sparrowhawk. Then there's a kind of a man-made post there. Uh, looking a bit gnarled with some, some nails and stuff in it for a different type of shot. And then there is um, a, a tree stump here 
again it's just a perch and um, there's a, a pot of bait on the back of that and then obviously the holes in it for, for the suet um, so so that's the setup uh, what I would say in terms of lens wise and, and um, if you were going to come here Pops has been using the 400 uh, mil prime and um, he's used that all day today he's never deviated from that and, and he's got some fantastic photographs which I'm sure you've seen throughout the video and if you've not I'll pop up on the end um, I started off with the 100 to 400 um, but I felt that the 500 and I brought my 500 mil with me uh, gave me the reach to those back posts um, and I've, I've, I've really enjoyed using the 500 mil to be honest with you and um, so I think you know 400 mil is probably your optimum the only things I tended to struggle with at the back was when the Sparrowhawk was was uh, flapping and flying off. Uh, the, the wings were quite often clipped in the 500 mil images. Um, but what I found was that for, for some of the smaller birds on this closer perch, the 500 mil was was really really uh, really good, a really good focal length. Um, but we'll have a conversation with Pops in a moment, and and we'll get his take on what he thinks of the 400 mil. Okay, Pops, do you want to? talk through the experience of today what your thoughts were um, well I'll be absolutely honest with you I'm blown away with this place and, and I say it every time we go to different hides but this really has um, blown me away it, that sparrow walk has never left us all day but the beauty of it is when it wasn't here we got a real diversity of, of um, songbirds that came in and birds that we particularly wanted to shoot, uh, which was the, the bullfinch. Or the red bull, as I like to call it. The red bull, as you <laughs> like to call it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that bonus was the, um, the tree creeper right at the side of us. Yeah. Which was uh, another cracking little bird to be up close and personal to. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's just been absolutely terrific. Yeah. Absolutely terrific. And I agree totally with, with Pops, you know, I think we, we discovered Cumbria Wildlife Hides, uh, that I, they've got a Facebook page and I'll put a screenshot of the Facebook page up on the screen now for you to see. Um, I'll put a link in the description to the Facebook page and, and you contact them through their Facebook page. Um, and we found this through a, another a friend of mine on Instagram had been here and, and he really rated it. He said it was a fantastic um a fantastic hide and they've got some great shots with the sparrowhawks so why don't we come down and try it and I, I think it's one of them places i've been desperate to come down for a long time but other things have come into place and and you know we've been mm. quite busy and and yeah. it, we just found the right time to come and actually um it's probably been a, a good thing actually because we've had a break in the really really bad wet weather uh, and, yeah. it, and it's been lovely here today you know we've had some fantastic light that's coming in i think initially this morning i was a little bit disappointed that it was quite dark in here um, and it is quite over you know it, it's got quite a heavy canopy above you um and that does block out the light but as the lights moved around throughout the day we've had some beautiful dappled light on the perches in front of us and I think it's, it, you know, it's definitely a hide I'd like to come back to, like you mentioned earlier in the winter when the canopy yeah, is not up. Yeah, yeah. I think when we'll, all the leaves have dropped. Yeah, um, I think we'll get a completely different experience then, yeah, won't we? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, if, if, if sparrowhawks are something that you want to photograph, we've been to a number of sparrowhawk hides now. We've um, obviously started off at Yorkshire Wildlife Hides and we had a fantastic time there. We've both been up separately to Alan McFadden's hide um, and photographed the sparrowhawks there, which is fantastic. And I would say that this is on par with, um, with the hides that we've been to previously. You know, it's, it's every bit as good as yeah. those hides that we've been to previously. Absolutely. Quite, I couldn't agree with you more because uh, you can't complain about the amount of times that sparrowhawk came down. No. Um, it was terrific, absolutely terrific. And for me, you know, it's it's not, um, it's it's a relatively new hide. I think it, um, Stephen said that it's been set up for 18 months and for 18 months work, you can tell a hell of a lot of work and effort has gone into here mm. um, because it is a truly fabulous setup. Um, you know, they were a little bit apologetic when we arrived here because you've not got the plush office chairs that you get in some of the hides uh, in here. It is a bench and, and, you know, yeah, I think at times that's been a little bit uncomfortable, but in all honesty, it's not affected the day at all. We've had a fantastic, fantastic time and mm. there has been absolute an abundance of wildlife to photograph um 
it's a place that I'd love to, to uh, see what comes down here in the evening at night time, you know, I think yeah, you, if you yeah. put some continuous lighting in place, you, I've no doubt in a place like this you probably get owls coming down and... Just about to say that, you know, it, it seems an ideal place uh, for, for owls to visit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and maybe a few badgers, foxes. Exactly. I've no know. doubt they get they yeah. get visits from things like that. Yeah. And I've no doubt uh, Stephen and Linda um, are aware of that because they, they, they have a trail camera up and, you know, the trail camera is monitoring the site all the time so they get to see that. Yeah. Um, so, first outing with your new 400mm lens, what do yeah. you think of that? Yeah, well, it's funny, if I just give you a bit of a preamble to that, um, I've just come back from um, 10 days up in Scotland and I was using my 100 to 400, uh, that's a Z lens, and I got some fabulous photographs with it, but I always always anchor after prime lenses i just think they give you that edge on quality um now why 400 as well i mean i know that i, I have a 500 pf lens yeah um which is a beautiful lens gives me great results what i've found is over the you know sort of the last couple of years is that hides like this the purchase are generally set up for a 500 mil lens which is perfect until you get a sparrow art flexing its wings and then you end up clipping the wings so that was the main reason to get the, the 100 to 400 was to give me that opportunity just to draw it in a little bit um, but I loved the, the 400 range um, so I sold a lot of me DSLRs and yeah. uh, lenses for them and treated myself to a, the uh, the prime the 400 f4.5 which also gives me an extra stop from the, the 100 to, to 400. Um, the other thing is, um, although it says, you know, the rest lens is the, the zoom lens, it's an S lens and it's supposed to be watertight, but it's an extending zoom. And I'm always a bit cautious and a bit worried about that zoom coming in and out, dust, water. Yeah. It's a chance I don't want to take. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. From looking at the images on the back of my, my camera, um, they look every bit as sharp as my 100 to 400. That I would imagine they'll be sharper. It, like you say, it's yeah. a prime lens over a zoom lens. So it's a prime lens. I yeah. would imagine they'll be sharper. They, they, they probably are, but having said that, that Z100 to 400 was superbly sharp. Yeah, yeah, you had no problem with the uh, no. sharpness of no. the images you took when you were in no. Scotland. No, I mean, if you think about them jumping squirrels that I, I managed to photograph, yeah. they're absolutely pin sharp. Yeah. Um, and I probably wouldn't have used my 400 prime on that. Yeah. Because you, you're dubious about the arc. You don't know how high those squirrels are going to jump. Yeah. So I just took it in a little bit, the zoom, um, and cropped in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, just to give me that flexibility. But first proper outing with my prime lens and... Uh, it looks as if it's all good. And at the start of the video, we promised you a comparison between the 400 and the 100 to 400, which I started using. And Pops, you know, very kindly lent me the 100 to 400. And for me, the only reason that I switched up to the 500 was the aperture. Um, at f4, I'm just getting so much more light in than I am at 5.6. Mm. Um, and because there wasn't a lot of light this morning, that little bit of extra aperture when when there wasn't the, the beams of light coming in i think just made the difference um and was the reason why i switched i probably shouldn't have done i probably should have stuck with the 100 to 400 i think the only way i'd have done that is if i'd have left my 500 at home when that 500's in my bag the temptation's always to pop it on because i just <laughs> love that lens and and you know i i, I know it produces supremely sharp images uh I, you know and it's focusing is is not hugely a problem i think if you're photographing well to be honest with you i used it on the red kites and i didn't struggle at all so focus speeds are, are, are good on it as well so i think i'll keep plugging away with that until it finally gives up the ghost on me and uh, and then i'll have to invest in something and at that point i'll probably start switching to z lenses yeah i, I think you, you made a good point there because there are a lot of people out there that have, have got uh, mirrorless cameras Nikon uh, Z cameras I'm dubious or worried about using an F lens on them yeah and in all honesty your experience my experience with my 500 PF 
there is no problem whatsoever in using F lenses. Yeah, I, I, you know. I, I mean, I've said previously, I think that actually the, the F uh, the F mount glass probably performs a little bit better on the Z9 than it did on the D500. Uh, that might just be to do with the Z9's capability, uh, but my perception is that it, that it performs every bit as good, if not a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to wrap the video up there. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it every bit as much as we have. Um, we've got the, the small uh, part of a two and a half hour drive on the way home now. Um, <laughs> Pops will probably fall asleep. Um, <laughs> if you've enjoyed this video please give us a, a like and a subscribe um, we're still probably at about 80% of viewers not subscribers um, I've said it in the past it costs nothing to be a subscriber I wish they'd change the name to be honest with you because subscription makes you think of money and, and people don't subscribe because they think it costs them something it costs you absolutely nothing um, but it does wonders for my channel and um, the more subscribers we have the more that YouTube listen to me um, and it gives me that little bit of influence so please consider subscribing if you've not already done so um, drop us a comment in the box below um, you know we love comments about places to visit um, the, the, I asked for that in the last video and, and I got you know some really good suggestions that Pops and I will go and have a visit to um, so if you know if you if you think there's a hide near you that it's definitely worth us um, going to and it's perhaps a hide that people don't necessarily know a lot about and you want to you know encourage people to go and take a visit there drop it in the comments below um, or alternatively if you want to, to contact me and you don't want to put something in the comments that's public you can contact me via my Instagram um, and direct message me on Instagram a lot of people are doing that now um, and, I, and I, I pick up all the messages on there um, can, I, can I just say two things one is a massive thank you to Linda and Steve um, who run this side fabulous side all down to their hard work yes super thank you uh, the other thing is is that I think uh, Daniel's mentioned it in the past that if you see us please stop us and have a chat with us um, as, as I said before I've just come back from Scotland the amount of people that I'm walking along and they said it's pops and I had wonderful conversations lovely people and they also come out with quite a lot of helpful hints and tips of the area uh, so please please stop us and have a chat with us and that leaves us to say one last thing until next time ta-ra ta <laughs>